Welcome to the Naked Life Podcast, where stripping is a way of life. I'm your host, Lo Wentworth. Shall we get started? Because I know you're ready. Hello, Naked Life listeners. Before we hop on with this week's guest, I want to talk about sacred validation. So sacred validation is a mastermind I am hosting in the beginning of 2023. We'll be starting mid-January, getting over the whole hustle and bustle of the holidays, and finally when you're ready to start taking back your life. I know, resolutions fall off the second week. And sacred validation is all about breaking the cycle of self-abandonment but also creating the identity you know you're meant to be and embodying her and what that looks like. And so that requires breaking the cycle of self-abandonment, learning how to validate your own feelings, your own thoughts, your own desires, and feeling and believing that there is no longer anything wrong with you and that there is everything right. Because I know probably right now you feel like there's something wrong with you, whether it be you can't get your love and affection from your family or you just can't attract the right friends or the right programs, investments, whatever it may be. You just feel like there's something wrong with you, so therefore you got to fix it. That's a form of self-abandonment, believing that there is something wrong with you when there is not. So Sacred Validation is a four-week mastermind with the option for private Voxer during this whole time with me so you can 10x and build that strong foundation of breaking the cycle of self-abandonment and really building on that self-identity and embodying who it is you're meant to be. Now, click the link in the bio to get signed up and pay in full option or payment plan option. And always, you can add on the Voxer option to work with me privately. But for the first three women who sign up, I will be giving away a 75 minute one on one hypnosis clarity refocus session that I offer to people. And that is a $5,555 program for three lucky women who decide to take the leap and really get into sacred validation. And with that, before with that, if there's any questions you might have, just email me, hit me up at IG on the dot naked.life.co and I'll answer all your questions. And with that, let us begin. Hello everyone and welcome to the Naked Life podcast. I'm so excited for today's guest because we'll be talking about boudoir shoots. Oh, I just love boudoir shoots and I think every woman should experience her own boudoir shoot. And with that, Gabby, I'll let you take it away and let everyone know who you are and what you're about. Hey, Lo, thanks for having me here. I'm so excited to have this conversation and to share what I know about boudoir and self-love and confidence with your audience. Um, Like you mentioned, I'm a boudoir photographer. I'm the owner and lead photographer at Embodied Art Boudoir in Denver, Colorado. Um, And I would call myself the mindful boudoir photographer because I use uh, my decade of experience in yoga, meditation, and mindfulness as a tool for personal growth and self-connection. I bring that into my work with clients in boudoir. Um, And I also, you know, it's such a big part of my life and it kind of bleeds over into other parts of my life as well. But I don't know any other boudoir photographer who leads guided meditations before shoots who takes such a um, uh, such an intentional approach to intention setting um, and that kind of stuff. So that's why I call myself the mindful boudoir photographer. <laughs> yeah, so my shoot, we didn't do that. There was no intention behind it. There's no mindfulness, but they did set it up very well. They did prepare me. They did. They had their energy was very much on fire. Nice. So when I did mine, like I had a hard time paring it down to like I think the thirty photos I ended up with. <laughs> yeah. Um. But how did you get into boudoir shooting? So I'm one of those people who's been, you know, photographing forever. So as at, at a certain point a few years ago, I got to a point in my career where I had been in um, in sales in different tech companies, and I got to the point in my career where I was just like so tired of being held back by. Honestly, it was usually my bosses who were just like dudes, um, <laughs> and they always not they always, but I felt so held back in what I could do, in what I could explore, in what I can learn and and how I could grow. 
And I realized I wasn't going to achieve the type of career growth I wanted or skill building I wanted by working for somebody else. Um, plus, you know, I, I'm not somebody who, you know, since I was little, I knew what I wanted to be or anything like that. For me, it was always just a huge question mark until like I started my business basically. And I was like, oh, this is where I'm supposed to be. <laughs> so I went to school for business and from that experience, I kind of knew that I wanted to start a business and I knew I wanted the, the freedom and that comes from having your own business. I know a lot of people would disagree with that statement because they feel kind of uh, maybe enslaved by their business or owned by their business. But for me, it's always been something to gain more freedom for myself. And as I've um, started a photography business and transitioned into boudoir, I realized it was also a really powerful vehicle for me to help others achieve more freedom in their lives and their personal expression. So I started a photography business that was not boudoir to start. Um, and after a year, I realized this is like a terrible fit for me. It was like, you know, couples photography and, and weddings and stuff, which basically means you're working like super early morning in Colorado. There's a lot of like sunrise photo shoots. So it's like driving hours and hours, um, waking up at like two or 3 AM to go to a photo shoot, working all weekends. And I was like, this is not the lifestyle I want. This doesn't achieve freedom <laughs> for me. So I had a friend who was like one of my very good friends, who's very encouraging encouraging and just like a really positive person who several times she was like, you need to try boudoir. You need to try boudoir. And I finally did. And I was like, Ooh, we're there. <laughs> so over the past couple of years, since transitioning from a, a wedding photography business to a boudoir photography business, I have just been, um, diving deep into all elements of making this business the best expression of myself that I can bring into the world and having the greatest and most positive impact that I can have on the people that I work with through like all the different education and practice and um, learning and implementation that I have been doing. So my question for you is like, you've done a lot of transitioning. So transitioning from sales to photography, a wedding photographer, and then to the boudoir photography, like during those transitions, were they easy or just some stuff come up? Like, what was that like for you? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. So I, hmm, how should I answer this? Some transitions were harder than others. When I first started my business, when it came to quitting my job and starting my business, that was pretty easy because I had learned to listen to those really strong, intense intuition hits, like those gut feelings. And when I when I moved to Colorado and a few months later, I went on um, like a van road trip. We rented a van, me and my partner, and we drove up to the Grand Tetons and I got there and I just realized I was just like, I had been debating for a long time about starting my business and when would I quit my job and all that kind of stuff. And I got there and I was just like, I'm done. <laughs> and it was just a sense of peace and a, like the debate in my head just completely stopped. I just realized this is the choice. And because I'm not overthinking it anymore, because I'm just like, I'm done, then it was easy from that point on. Uh, and when I got back, I gave my two weeks notice and moved on. When it came to switching from wedding to boudoir, I think that was a really good example of it not being easy because I was taking on other people's shoulds and other people's ideas of how business should be run, of how life should be taken, of how, uh, you know, all of that stuff should quote unquote should be done. And I was putting way too much weight in other people's opinions as somebody who I was like, you know, I'm new to business, so I should listen to the advice of, you know, the business gurus out there, or whatever. Um, and what I realized, you know, a big piece of advice that I had received or taken in from a lot of different sources that I was getting my education and advice from was to niche down, to specialize. And I 
think I specialized and niche down way too early. I didn't give myself room to explore different genres and to figure out which one truly works for me on a practical level, not just on a cognitive level, not just like, oh, this one seems nice on paper, or it seems like I can make a decent living off of it, or it seems like good, you know? So I'm going to commit to that one versus letting myself explore and play and discover what truly works for me. So that one was more difficult. And I think that as soon as I, it was a long drawn out process of like maybe six or nine months or something before I finally completely closed down the old business and um, completely focused uh, on boudoir. Um, and even now in boudoir, if I have somebody come out to me, even though my specialty is boudoir, if I have like, I, I just talked to a friend yesterday at a, a networking event that I went to, I saw her, I met her like earlier this summer. She's like, um, I know your specialty is boudoir, but I really want to do a branding shoot and I'd love to work with you. And I was like, yeah, let's do it because I know what to do. Like, I know I have the skills. I know I can coach. I know I can get the shots and I'm done holding myself back from exploring and playing in other things, even though my specialty and where I put my like marketing focus is boudoir. So it was that second transition, um, was definitely a lesson for me in, tuning out the outside world and tuning into what truly works for me from like a, a, a values level, a lifestyle level, um, how it just sits in my body and how the experiences are with my clients. Uh, all of that, I learned to stop listening to other people's advice so much that it kind of quiets down my own inner voice. I think that's very important um, for especially women to like shut down the outside world and really get connected within. I feel like as women as a whole, as a collective, we're awakening into that, but it's a struggle because you're supposed to like take in all of this information and quote unquote, be the good girl when it's like, wait a second, my intuition is like, nope, I need to burn this bridge and just shift and start over. Yeah, exactly. And it really, um, it's so much easier now. It was a very hard lesson to learn because it was just not that the lesson itself is a difficult one, but, you know, taking something from the cognitive level to the experiential level can present challenges and hurdles that we have to work our way through to get to the other side. So, um, it was a really great experience for me. And now the amount of business education I take in from external sources, I have slashed it so hard. Like I have gone from, you know, maybe listening to a million podcasts and following a million Instagram accounts that talk about photography business or business in general and all this kind of stuff to way narrowing it down to just a handful of sources that I feel like are a value fit to me and not listening or inputting so much. But to input and give myself time to process through my own lens and take action and then maybe learning something new. Mm -hmm. I think that's very important also like paring it down because um, I had in the beginning of my own personal development journey, like I was taking in so much in information. There was one coach who was just like, yeah, I'm part of this mastermind. I only go to one event that they have. They have events three times a year, but I only go to one event and get that one nugget. And that's all I need. And I was For like a year. Like, I was just like, how the fuck do you do that? <laughs> but I mean, this is like sensory overload. And I'm just like, wait, what? You spent, I don't know, we'll just say like 20K on this. And I'm like, what? And you just go to one for one? Okay, cool. But now I like understand that like in my own journey, in my own evolution, like I'm working with one coach and then next year it's me full on taking on like my femininity and really what diving into what that looks to me and I already know who I want to work with and who like she is and when she opens up her one-on-ones I'm like I'm snagging it but it's just very interesting how it's like I've gone you've gone from this big huge lens to like nope this person feels aligned that's who I want to work with yeah exactly keeping it simple because what what one thing that I've noticed, especially as somebody who does practice um, yoga and mindfulness, is we it is so important to be highly critical and highly conscious of what we're taking in and all the different inputs. And so one of my one of my 
you know, kind of casual life practices is dedicated silence. So, you know, I will drive in the car with no music, no podcasts, no anything, and just focus on a single thing, driving. That's a mindfulness practice. Or, you know, I am definitely a person who when I'm cooking, I, you know, I like to have a TV show on in the background or something on just to keep me like entertained. But when I'm feeling my thoughts get a little scattered, my focus is harder to, it's harder to like put my focus on something or I feel unfocused or um, my thoughts feel disruptive or disrupted, then I'll try, okay, I'm going to cook with no input. I'm just going to, you know, work on the food, pay attention to the feeling of things under my hands, looking closely at all the food, all of this kind of stuff, and just do single tasking. <laughs> so multitasking is definitely related, I think, to this topic in that as we, you know, taking in a lot of inputs from a lot of different sources can disrupt our own thought pattern, disrupt our own ability to find our own truth inside and what's right for us. And multitasking, similarly, it trains the focus to be distracted. It trains our focus to switch because you're never actually focused on two things at once. Like you're constantly switching. If you're like cutting and watching a TV show, you're only doing one at a time. You're not truly like doing both at the same time. So I'm a huge advocate for single tasking and seeing where in our life we can multitask less. I know it's not like, not, I think there's a lot of people who cannot single task all the time because we just got modern busy lives and there's a lot going on. And sometimes the only time you have to listen to your favorite podcast is on your commute to work or something like that. And, or during your gym time. And there's no shame in that, but just to kind of, um, bring that awareness inward and kind of, decide, okay, I'm going to stop taking in other people's thoughts and opinions for a little bit. And I'm going to instead focus on listening to what my thoughts and opinions and like my direction is. I never heard anyone uh, describe it as like single mindedness. Um, I know for me, it's a lot of times where I just notice like I'm bored. Like I'm trying to do all the things and I'm like, this is boring. I'm not paying attention to shit. Yeah. Or I noticed like with working out in the beginning, I would listen to music and do all of this. And then all of a sudden it was just like, I don't want, I just want to work out. I want to go there, work out, no headphones. I don't want to worry. I don't even want my cell phone with me. Yeah. It's just like print out the workout and then do it. What's the difference for you? What, what changed when you went from listening to music during your workout to just being with the workout? Well, going with the workout example is like the workout is my time. Like, I don't like working out with people. I have, a, I would work out with a trainer. I'd be like 30 minutes, 45 minutes max. And it's just like, boom, boom, boom. This is not me coming in to, you're not my therapy session. You're the one that's supposed to be kicking my ass right now. And me internally swearing or vocally swearing at you for making <laughs> me do things that I don't necessarily want to do. And it's like, it's my time. And it, I think it just over since... I became like protective of it, like being my time and not be when people were like, Oh, Hey, let's work out together. Being like, no, I think just gradually it was just like, I'm tired of having my cell phone with me. Cause then it's like, I can check my email. I can go on Instagram or like someone texts come in. Or then I was just like, also I was a towards the tail end of law school. And I think I was just having this, decision fatigue and I was like mm -hmm. I don't even want to decide what to listen to right now like you yeah. tell me what to do we go that's it yeah. just tell me so I think that's what came in and I noticed like again like with taking my dogs on the walk it's like I don't even want to listen to anything I just want to walk just be with your dogs right be present with them notice the sights and sounds around you that's all mindfulness practice Mm -hmm. That's all training your attention. It's training your focus. And when we are in a mindful place, when we are practicing mindfulness, the natural end result of that is increased confidence, increased self-acceptance, increased self-esteem. Because when we're truly present in the moment and like taking in our surroundings or totally engaged in the task that we're doing at the moment, our mind is not occupied with worrying, ruminating, um, anxiety, complaining, judging, shaming. 
our mind is just doing the thing that our body is also doing. So that is a practice of mind body alignment and connection, which naturally improves so many areas of our life. Mm -hmm. So when I started, I went through yoga teacher training. And when I did that, I was just like, yoga is a sport. And people were like, Mm. yoga is not a sport. (laughs) I'm like, yoga is a sport. The injuries that come from yoga is because you're out of alignment. Like something you didn't place in alignment. Like my, at least during my training, they were also very focused on making sure the body was aligned. So like, Mm -hmm. bone, like, what was it? Joint over joint, like bones in a line. So that Mm -hmm. way they're creating the planes. And I'm like, this is a fucking sport. And then it's like, it's also a sport because it's just you and the mat. Like how many times do they say like in football or basketball was my sport and all it's like, it's a mind game. Like 99% of it is a mind game. 1% is the physical. And it's just like, it's a sport. That is why it's a sport. Golf is not a sport. That's my opinion. <laughs> I know that starts a lot of war with people, but I'm like, golf is no not flames. a sport. <laughs> and I'm like, yoga is. And that just sends people off. Yeah, I definitely think the way that yoga is presented in our kind of society in the Western context, it's just the physical side of yoga that's presented. And when you are paying attention to just a physical practice, then yeah, it does become a sport. Um, I definitely, you know, I could get on my whole soapbox about how yoga is a thousands year old spiritual practice and the way we teach it in the West, like dilutes it down to just one tiny little part of it and kind of like forgets about all the amazing breadth and depth of, of science and learning that could be had to make us happier and better and and more content people, but I'll leave that for another time. (laughs) (laughs) You can do a whole debate on whether yoga is actually sport, but that is actually true. (laughs) Like diving in, like they did little different pieces of it. And I don't know how they do the program now, but it was just like introducing like the chakras. And then there was meditation. There was some other stuff. There was one book we read called how yoga works. And I completely hated the book. I hated it because what people understand in law school is like you guys get so frustrated when you go to a lawyer and they're like, oh, well, it depends. The number one and number two answer in law school you ask is it depends. And what do you think? And it's just like, <laughs> I asked you the question. I don't know. <laughs> so that's how I felt. But then I, I realized I got it because I figured it out on my own. But there was something that you were talking about, like, people becoming like connection with the mindfulness and just being present that I wanted to talk about being confident is like you create a safe space within yourself. I know so many people are like, we need to create safe spaces, which is like outward validation, but it's like, you have to create a safe space within yourself. So when you're doing the mindfulness and becoming aware, which can be overwhelming and discombobulating in the beginning, because you're not like, it's all of a sudden it's just you and the one thing and then your thoughts are coming at you because there's space there for you actually to connect with yourself. Yeah. At least when it comes to my work and boudoir, I definitely feel like me being settled and centered and connected to myself and being in a state of peace and ease. When I bring that into my space with my clients, that's what kind of sets the tone. And it's me kind of giving them permission to do the same. And of course, I use explicit guidance as well to help them do so from the guided meditation we do before the shoot to we have quite a long sit down conversation where we talk about agency, boundaries, consent, all that kind of good stuff. Um, And we I lead um, very intentional like mind body awareness throughout the entire photography session itself, including, you know, some light breath work. And I don't think I would be able to to lead that space, to create that space where my clients feel comfortable to step fully into themselves and pay full attention to themselves and what's going on in their own mind, body and heart if I was not also in that place. Because I have seen it. I also, you know, I went through my yoga teacher training. And one of the things I remember the most from when I started teaching yoga and then when I um, started uh, coaching photography with with clients versus like landscapes or, you know, candid stuff that I was just doing a hobby before was that our own internal state has such an effect on what we say. So I'm not sure if maybe you kind of experienced this during your 
teacher training, but how often do you see new teachers say something like, okay, um, like I want you to put your left hand here and then to put your right hand on your lower back and then open your chest. And <sighs> you know, that is not settled at all. That is nervous, anxious energy, which is fully understandable. This is not a judgment at all. It's a matter of observation. You can see how when you're nervous, it reflects in your voice and in your energy and the other person can pick up on that. And the result is confusion and uncertainty versus picture probably your trainer or other teachers that you may have experienced who have been teaching for 10, 20 years and they breathe while they're giving their instruction. Left hand goes to the top left corner of your mat. Take a deep breath in and on your exhale, reach around and place your right hand on your lower back. Take a deep breath in. And the difference in the energy and the difference in what it allows the student or the coachee or whatever to do, it's astounding. It makes such a difference. So it's not like that teacher is going up in front of the room and saying, I'm going to make a safe space for you guys today. <laughs> it's not about saying it. It's about modeling it. Mm hmm. I think that's very important. It's just like I very much there's one question I hate, like when I was interviewing for jobs, it's like, what are your top three qualities? Or like, what do you think of yourself? I'm like, if I have to tell you that I'm not it. <laughs> like, if I have yes. to be like I'm confident or I'm quiet or any of this I'm not any of that because then mm -hmm. and then I'm also like well if I say that and I believe we'll just go with the confidence thing I'm like if I believe I'm confident and then you're looking at me you're just like mm, that doesn't match up it's like it feels like there's a failed test there which is also being like it's a stupid question throw it out just be, the thing. <laughs> just be it yeah they should be able to tell who you are from the experience talking to you. And I get, I feel like interviews are kind of one of those weird situations where it's like <laughs> the level of anxiety is high, even for a normally probably mm -hmm. chill person. <laughs> but I think that's a really good example. Like stop telling, start being. Mm -hmm. Which gets me in like, can you walk like step by step, a cl new client comes in and what the process is for them working with you and what that looks like and how they become, you know, comfortable and confident in that space to just let themselves unleash. Sure. So the process starts before they get to my studio. The process starts on our very first phone call before they book. I, Because it is such an intimate encounter and it is very personal space and a personal style of photography um, where, you know, I often photograph clients who are nude or partially nude. It's a very vulnerable space. So for both their safety and for mine, for their comfort and for mine, um, I talk to everybody on the phone before they book a session with me. So we talk on the phone and even from the very first phone conversation, I ask them, why are you doing this? I get them starting to think about their intention. Why are you showing up here today? And I ask about why you're showing up here today. Why do you want to do this? Actually, when I ask on the phone call, it's the second time they've had to answer that question. Because as we speak about why or why, we get deeper and deeper and deeper. So I ask several times to get people to start peeling back those layers and understanding on a deeper layer, on a deeper level, why they want to do this. Like, what is your intention for this experience? So... I start with a phone call. I ask what their intention is. I talk about um, what I offer and, you know, both the logistical side of things, like the concrete things that you receive when you pay, um, but also my philosophy um, and the type of experience they'll receive, how, how there is a lot of elements of mindfulness and yoga um, interwoven into the experience, um, how I really want them to feel educated and prepared and confident before they even step into the studio. So from the phone call, then... Um, and I also want people to feel a sense of agency. So people know when they book a, on the phone call, like how much they have to pay to get down. But before... Um, but I don't make anyone pay for their photos at that point. I, I send them price guides and information and they have like a week to like, or even more 10 days to kind of go through all the materials before they hop on me, the, hop on the phone with me again, ask me any questions they may have and decide like what they want to purchase. So I want people to feel like they have spaciousness throughout the entire process to consider and to find um, what's right for them. 
And I totally don't believe in like high pressure sales. And, you know, I probably could be making a lot more money if I did do that, but I feel more in integrity <laughs> um, with uh, my, my own self and more aligned with what uh, value I want to bring to my clients when I tell them like, I'm, I'm not, I'm going to help you find the best option for your budget. And I will be happy with that because I wouldn't sell it if I wasn't happy selling it. <laughs> so it starts there. I, you know, I very much believe in agency and the power of choice for my clients because they're, especially a lot of women in this world feel like they don't have that power of choice in a lot mm -hmm. of circumstances. So I want my space to be one where everything is their choice. Um, so then before their session, they will receive a lot of um, educational materials, not just on like, oh, what kind of outfits to bring and stuff like that, but also, you know, how do you set an intention? Here's like a guided process and and other stuff like that. I also do a like a pre-session phone consultation. So if they have any nerves or any questions about outfits or anything like that, they have another chance to talk to me human to human before they come into the studio. When they do arrive to the studio, um, I include hair and makeup in my session. So in my view, it's part of this stepping into a different world where you're the one being taken care of. So in, you know, most of us, most women, a lot of my clients have kids, a lot, like most of my clients have careers. So they're used to taking care, right? They're used to taking care of others and kind of meeting deadlines and having to perform. So when they step into my studio, immediately I meet them at the car. I take all their bags. I come in. I have them seated. Um, we talk about, you know, their preferences for their styling during their session. And we customize, you know, their look to them. There's no just like, this is the boudoir look. No, it's like, what, what outfits did you bring in? What do you normally wear for makeup? How do you normally do your hair? Would this make you feel comfortable? Did you have any wishes or desires? or something that you want to see. So you have everyone who comes in from like the most minimal um, sort of looks to orange eyeliner and orange eyeshadow, you know, everything is welcome. <laughs> there's no, there's no set intention. It's your choice. It's your session. It's your body. Um, so we go, we do the hair and makeup and they get to really get into that environment of being taken care of, of relaxing. And then we go into the studio. We have a conversation that I mentioned before about like boundaries, agency, consent, I have found that it's not enough to assume that people will tell you this pose is uncomfortable for me. I want to get out. I explicitly state at several points, there is nothing that I am requiring you to do here. This is not my vision. Um, this is not my session. And I don't have a set idea in mind for what needs to happen here. This is your session. This is your body. You are the boss of your body. And only you know when something doesn't feel right. And it sometimes this has to do with injuries and stuff. You know, if somebody has a knee issue, they might not want to kneel or they might be able to kneel for like a few seconds, but more than that gets too painful. Sometimes it's not related to an injury at all. You know, like some people just don't feel good in certain positions. So I make it very, very clear from the, from the beginning, like boudoir posing is like somewhat athletic, you know, it does it like there's some poses that just feel like super loungy, like a nice stretch and other poses that your muscles can tremble <laughs> and you will be sore afterwards. So it is your, I tell people in no uncertain terms, it is your responsibility to make sure that your body feels good and feels safe. And I am here to respect anything that you choose. You do not need to ask me to get out of a pose that doesn't feel good. You get out of it and then let me know and I'll find something else for you because we have a million options. So I find that really important. And I find that unless I explicitly state it, most people default into the performing or people pleasing or, well, she said this pose, so I just got to do it until she says I can get out. No, that is not how we do things. <laughs> In my well, studio. that translates to your face too as well. Yes. Yeah. So the face stuff, um, the face, oh, the face is one of my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me more. How do you relax your face? Because I remember when I did my boudoir shoot, I even said, I'm like, damn, I should have done yoga to stretch because my back was so tight. And mm -hmm. it was a po it was a picture I wanted. And I understand that sometimes you got to contort your body in different ways to try to give get that picture. But I was just like damn and they're like relax your face and I'm like how the fuck do I do that right now please tell me 
Yeah, um, I have a very strong belief that relax your face or make a sexy face is just like empty words. What does that even mean? What does Mm -hmm. relax your face mean? What does a sexy face look like? How many of us, you know, I would say we, there's a lot of people, there's a lot of women in the public eye who make sexy faces for, for like the phone influencers, they make sexy faces in the mirror and like, they know what it looks like. I would say the vast majority of women does not, do not know what their sexy face looks like because the vast majority of women aren't like posing in the mirror. You know, that's just like, I think it's, I think we just see a lot of women who pose in the mirror because they're the ones who post the pictures online. (laughs) And I just think a lot of us don't do that. (laughs) So I don't tell, I show and I be. Again, it's I have to be. So a big part of my education in photography and in boudoir was learning how to coach for different facial expressions, body language and emotional expression through displaying it. So I actually have done a lot of practicing sexy face in the mirror (laughs) so that I can make eye contact with my clients and say, hey, take a deep breath with me, look down. And then I honestly, it gets noisy in there. And if you don't mind, I will get noisy right now with you. (laughs) But basically... I make noise and I get all into the emotion. It has like a scientific backing. If you ever heard about like mirror neurons, which is when one person looks at another and the like brain subconsciously kind of copies the emotion that other person is feeling. So, you know, a good example is when you look at like a a happy baby smiling and you might smile back in response, Mm -hmm. not because you're happy, but because their happiness triggered a happiness in you. Or you watch a movie and somebody's crying and you start crying. It's not because you are sad. It's because their emotion triggered that emotion in you. So I model different emotions and different facial expressions for my clients to take it on to their their own. And they always do it in their own way. So I might like before. The, okay, I'm going to I'm going to rewind just a little bit to give better context to this. So after the talk, we do a meditation, a guided meditation. The my, meditation um it's one of my favorites. It's from this book, Real Love by Sharon Salzberg, a loving kindness, um, mindfulness uh, meditation instructor um, who's been teaching for like decades. And um, it is a, a beautiful practice to connect to your body and your breath. So it's a mindfulness meditation. You start like bringing a conscious attention to your breathing and you start connecting to different parts of your body. And then we dive into the photo shoot after doing this like body connection and breath connection practice, which makes the emotional side of things way easier. When we get into the session, we've already gotten to the point that my client is comfortable breathing out loud. You've probably seen this in yoga classes where people are uncomfortable making their breath audible to other people in the class, right? The lion's breath. Yes. The lion's breath is a great one for getting people out of their comfort zone because if I, I, help them get to the place where they feel settled and comfortable enough to express emotion in front of me by doing it first. I do it first. So I'll say, you know, I'll do the breathing first. (sighs) And by breathing loud, I'm giving them permission to breathe loud. And I also explicitly state it, start breathing loud because I'm going to have you like moaning and stuff during the session. (laughs) And then when we get into the session, um, I start displaying the different emotions, whether it's, you know, something happy, I start giggling and like, hee hee, yeah, let's play. Let's like whip our hair around and let's have fun. And you see how I like made my voice different. And I, um, I started laughing myself and wiggling a lot. <laughs> People on audio can't see that. So I'll just say, I'm like wiggling around, I'm moving my shoulders, I'm lightening up and kind of loosening up my body. And then they copy me. They start doing that too. And when it comes to something like um, make a a sexy face, I don't need to say make a sexy face. I say, okay, now close your eyes and take your hand and feel your fingers running down your chin, running down your jawline, running over your breasts and down your thighs. Then take a deep breath. Oh, it feels so good. Feel the different textures under your skin. Skin, under your fingers, how beautiful, how soft your skin feels, how lovely the lace feels. And by getting into that kind of pleasurable state myself, I'm giving them permission 
to get into that pleasurable state and to by I always start with like the eyes closed stuff first because it brings our attention inward and I cue a lot of physical awareness like feel the sensations under your fingertips like feel the different fabrics in your outfit feel how good your skin feels under your hand to get them paying attention to their body so they're not in their heads thinking oh my god i look ridiculous or i look silly or i look stupid or anything like that because i'm doing it even more than them <laughs> you know and they're rather than overthinking it they're able to switch in from a thinking mode to a feeling mode and that's where we get like, that. I don't need to tell them what to do with their face because they start doing it. Mm. Oh, so many nuggets. I think it's very interesting how you basically you take over as like the masculine container for them to step into their feminine for like the first time probably ever for most people when they're coming to do the boudoir shoot. Yeah, um, they don't have to think. I'll do, I'll do all the thinking for them. And honestly, my coaching got better when I stopped doing a lot of thinking and I switched into feeling mode as well. And mm -hmm. I look at a scene, I used to use shot lists and stuff like that of like basically a shot list for anyone who doesn't know is like a list of poses you might want to do, right? Oh, on the first outfit, I'm going to do like these four poses. On the second outfit, I'm going to do these six poses, that kind of thing. When I switched from doing shot lists to simply being in the moment, to feeling and to observing the scene and observing my client, that's when my work just got so much better and so much more genuine because I'm not putting people into a box. I am instead seeing how their body wants to express itself right now or seeing this like I love I don't have a client closet because I love seeing what outfits people bring for themselves from their closet, see the way their personality expresses itself outwardly through their clothing. And I see, oh, with this outfit, you know, the back looks really cool. So let's do some poses where you're over here. Um, you also said that you really like your butt and your long legs. So let's do some poses to complement those and to complement the outfit. And we take it from there. God, that sounds like so much fun. I'm like, sign me up. Um... <laughs> it is fun. <laughs> Yeah, I can't imagine like going to a boudoir shoot and them just having the clothes there for you. I I would kind of get a little skeeved by that. That that feels a little well. I'm I mean that's fine. It still would be just like I'm like no, <laughs> no thank you. Honestly, I'm with you. And also, like, how many of us have bought cute lingerie online or in stores, thinking, oh, I'm gonna wear it because it's super cute, and we never wear it because we don't have a reason to. So I honestly think it's a great excuse for people to wear the super cute stuff that they've bought. Like, it's a good excuse to wear it. Like, we oftentimes don't have a reason to wear it. <laughs> so here, here's your reason. Bring in all that cute stuff that you've only worn once, and your like partner's like, I'd rather see you naked. <laughs> <laughs> whatever it is <laughs> or like you thought you'd wear this bustier to the club and then you put it on you're like i'm not wearing this in public no. <laughs> this is a private outfit <laughs> or you, like even putting on like a like a corset and bustier i'm just like that's a lot of work oh my god that's it's a, a lot, lot of work, work. <laughs> and it's just like and it's also sitting like how do you sit and then if yeah. you have to go to the bathroom like if you're in the club like drinking no. a lot don't want to pop the seal that makes it even worse and i'm just like no yeah. No. I had an ex. I did that. I dressed it and I'm like, I'm no longer doing corsets. I hate these. We're done. <laughs> like, I can't. I can't, like, yes, you rip it off as soon as you can, but I'm like, right? if you put it on, it's just like, I'm I'm done. Mm -hmm. Tired. Put me to bed after that. Um. So how many of your clients come to you just because they want to have a boudoir shoot or because they like want to gift it to someone like they feel like they have to oh I'm gonna do this for my partner and gift it to them yeah so there are definitely you know I would consider one like an external motivator you know people who are getting married people with an upcoming like a partner's um birthday an upcoming holiday like Christmas uh, like a gift giving holiday or an upcoming anniversary those are like the external motivators for a lot of people and uh many people who are in relationships, that is what drives them to start looking at boudoir. You know, that's what drives them to make the Google search of like boudoir photographers in my area. Um, 
I also get a lot of clients who are not in relationships and for them, they don't have that external motivator of a gift to others. So their external motivator is a gift or they go straight to the internal motivation of a gift for myself. Um, All of my clients, whether they originally came in with the intention of having a gift for um, a partner or whether they came in thinking this is something I'm doing for me, all of them end up in that place where they're like, wow, what an amazing gift to myself. <laughs> so um, it's definitely a mix, but I definitely do think I get a lot of people who come in with the intention of doing something for themselves because of the way I do my marketing and because of all the stuff that I've been talking about, like that's all on my website, that's all on my social media. Like that's the way I talk about what I do. And I'm more than happy to, um, work for either people and to give anyone what they want. Like if somebody is coming in intentionally as, um, with the intention of getting a gift for a partner, then I will absolutely kind of help guide them towards outfits that maybe like their partner might like, you know, some of them. Um, Like I had one client who came in with a t-shirt with like a movie logo that her partner was like obsessed with this movie when they first met. And then he was like, how have you not watched this movie? And then he made her watch the movie on like their second date. And then she stole his t-shirt with the movie. And it was like basically her t-shirt now, you know, as we do sometimes. Um, And then she got like, she basically bought a new version of the t-shirt because the old one was like 10 years old and ratty at that point. (laughs) And I made sure to get some poses that showed off the t-shirt and showed a little bit more external facing emotion, like more of like, oh, I want you eyes kind of stuff, because those photos were a little bit more geared towards the partner, while at the same time making sure that I also um, got plenty of photos that felt like they were just for her. So I kind of, I work with them both, you know, there's like this whole thing of like the male gaze or whatever. And I think that there's not like one stance all uh, like pro or against, like for sure we're doing this for ourselves. But like if somebody is coming in with the intention of getting something for their partner as a gift, like I'm absolutely going to work with them on making that happen. You know, if they say my partner's favorite feature of me is my butt, I'm going to get some bomb butt pics. But you know, even if they don't, I will still get some bomb butt pics. (laughs) You know, because you got to see that too. It looks good. (laughs) Yeah. Or as I said, like, um, my I'm single right now, but I'm just like, if my future partner isn't grabbing my ass more than I am, we got a problem. Yeah, right. <laughs> there, is an issue. there is an issue here. Um, so my intention with asking that question is I find it very interesting, like more and more women are geared toward that. And also when I was doing my volunteer coaching before I even did a boudoir shoot, mind you, we'll just caveat that I was coaching some women I'm just like here here's the company do the boudoir shoot just do it it'll be fun and they did it and it was just like it was amazing just to see like the confidence like the before and after and they just did it for themselves and when people found out I was doing mine they're just like well who are you doing it for because again I was single at the time I'm like myself Mm -hmm. (laughs) like why can't I do it myself and then it was also interesting because people were like, well, can we see the photos? And I'm like, fuck no. These photos are, <laughs> are not for you. Not for you. They are for me. Like, no, you don't get to see these photos. Yeah. I think there is that um, kind of cultural idea that we need to be doing it for somebody else. And I think mm-hmm. that plays a lot into these, these like, cultural beliefs that have been instilled in us that, you know, as women, we do things for others and not for ourselves and investing that much money in ourselves is selfish when we have kids or partners or charities we could give that money to and all that kind of stuff. Um, So I definitely feel like there is this, you know, cultural idea of it should be done for somebody else because it's too selfish to do it for yourself. So I definitely push back against that. And you like, if you look at my website, it's all about what this is for you. Like this mm-hmm. experience is for you. At the end of the day, you're the one going through the photo shoot. You're the one who's going to be holding your photos in your hands um, afterwards. Like you're the one who's going to be doing all of it and it's for you. So if somebody else gets to benefit from them, from this, from these photos, <laughs> good for them, but they're still <laughs> your photos. I've had clients who are in relationships come in and say, oh, these are for sure for me. And, you know, maybe if my partner is nice, I'll show it to them. <laughs> they're like, maybe I'll show them this, but this will be just for me. And there is nothing wrong with that at all. 
No, there isn't. Um, the company I went with, they're on the East Coast, and they're just like, you don't know how many times you have VP clients come and be like, no, 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 this one's for this one's my session. Like the first session was for their partner or whatever. Like this is mine. I'm just like, good for them. Yeah, good for them. Hell yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that was just so much fun. And I still like I look I looked at the pictures the other day because I'm just I'm working through like, look, there's a program being birthed. And I'm just like, mm. do I use some of these pictures? Do I not use these pictures? I'm like, I'm, there's going to be another boudoir shoot in my future. I just know. I just don't know when. Like, what does that look like? And I'm looking at these pictures. and I'm like, fuck. I was getting turned on by just looking at myself. Yeah. Like, looking at those photos. And that was how many years ago. Um, and I think every woman should feel that, yeah. that experience. Yeah, mm. absolutely. <laughs> so uh, one of my final questions for you is like someone who's teetering on wanting to do the boudoir shoot, but yet are still struggling with body acceptance, loving their body because they think it needs to look a certain way. Like, what would you say to that person? Mm. Ooh, that's exactly why you need to do a boudoir shoot. Boudoir shoot. Okay, so I'm sure you've heard this about yoga. I can't practice yoga. I'm not flexible enough. And what do you think in return? You think, no, it's the other way around. You practice yoga asana and you gain flexibility. That's how I be- that's what I think about a boudoir shoot and basically anything that scares the shit out of you. In my opinion, um, Confidence is made up a lot of things, but a lot of confidence is doing stuff that scares the shit out of you and proving yourself that you are capable. That even if you didn't succeed the first time, the second time, the 10th time on something, you know, something that takes learning or like learning a language or something like that. Even if you don't succeed immediately, you showed up for yourself. You did it. That is how we grow confidence. And that is why, like, I recommend people to sign up for boudoir photo shoots before they think they're ready. Um, for so many reasons, I have to figure out really quick, where do I want to go with this? Because there's so many things I can talk about in this. But I'll mention two things. One is kind of that confidence angle. This is part of your journey to take a step forward on your acceptance and your love for yourself and your body. This is part of the journey. You don't have to get there to have done it. Some people do like using a boudoir shoot as a celebratory marker of they accomplished something great in their lives. So now let me celebrate it with a food photo shoot. Wonderful. But if you're the kind of person that you're like, not the kind of person, but if you're experiencing that you haven't accomplished something specifically, but you want to practice self-love and practice body acceptance because our bodies change. Like, you know, I have a lot of people come in saying, you know, I had kids and I looked back at pictures from when I was 21 and I was like, what did I think was even the problem? Like I was so hot and now my body is different and I know it's never going to be the same as pre-kids. Um, but I need to reset my body image and kind of learn to love this version of me. So as I age, I can age with contentment. Um, and even if you don't have kids, honestly, like your body still changes as you age with every year, with every month, your body's different. That we have this idea in our society that bodies need to stay, especially female bodies, need to be like like a wax figure that doesn't change or age when really the body changing is the most inevitable part of the human experience that every single body will share. Nobody can escape it. Um, Our bodies will change. And when we can learn to practice contentment, gratitude, appreciation, acceptance, and love and respect towards our bodies, no matter what they look like, that will clear up so much mental clutter for us to be able to show up fully to our lives, our relationships, um, our careers, all that kind of stuff. The second point I want to make is that I truly believe there is beauty in every body. I don't think that you have to be skinny or fit or any of these like, you know, um, Western idealized body type in order to practice acceptance towards your body or see your body as beautiful. I think what makes me really good at my job is I see all bodies as beautiful because I'm not just seeing a body, I'm seeing the human that rests inside of it. And that's what I want you to see as well when you look at your photos. So there's no, I need to lose like 15 pounds before I go in because that's not going to change anything except for like 
the clothes that you wear and the size, you know, whatever. That's literally the most worthless, external, like unimportant number I can think of is my pant size. <laughs> like I cannot think of a more useless number for me and the way that I live my life. Especially um, for women. Especially for women, our bodies you will You can't get the age. same. But with like the pan size, like a man can go in and he's like, what, I don't know, 32, 36, yeah. 30, or like 45. I'm making up these numbers, yeah, okay? Yeah. But it's literally, they know their measurements. They can go in and there might be a slight change to what, like a boot cut from, I don't know, Levi's to Wrangler's. Like the of the fabric or whatever. Right, or something. But women, yeah. it's just like, I'm a size, I don't I don't even know what a size I am. I'm, just gonna, like, I'm a size of 10 and then you go to another floor you're a six and then you go to another yes. floor you're a 16 and then it's just like and then it's like you can't even say you like oh okay I'm a 10 at this store no 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 no, no. next season you probably a 12 because yeah. they changed something on it so then it was just like it was f- so interesting because the guy friends didn't understand like if I found a pair of jeans I loved I would just immediately buy like five pairs of that of the same one like clear them out they're like why and I'm like you don't understand you don't get it (laughs) you don't get it so I was just like and that's where it's just like along with like the weight thing because I've had to heal some wounds that my mother projected on me with like my body image and weight it was just like my value is not in a number so I don't even know how much I weigh I don't even like looking in the beginning when I started this I would immediately take the size the number size out of the the jeans because I just I didn't need to see that was building up that who cares it's irrelevant right exactly (laughs) so there was my little TED talk about jeans (laughs) (laughs) um before I ask the final question is there anything you'd like to share with the audience um before we hop off and I ask the final question yeah I kind of mentioned it before, but I think that listening to a long conversation, it could be easy to kind of pick up a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. And if I wanted somebody to pick up one thing that could make a difference for them today, it's going to be just being present with your body. And for me, uh, the easiest way to do that is through my breath. So just taking a few deep breaths into the diaphragm, closing my eyes breathing in through my nose and breathing out through my mouth like a sigh. And just doing that when I'm feeling scattered, anxious, um, judgmental towards myself or others, um, when I'm feeling these ways that erode self-esteem and erode confidence, nothing to me in my personal practice and experience has been more powerful than just simply existing without all that stuff. And by training my attention on my breath, and connecting to my body, it really helps me tune out all that trash that we get in our heads <laughs> and just simply exist and show up much more settled, peaceful, easeful, and happy to my life. Gabby, I enjoyed this so much. We could have gone so many different ways. <laughs> yeah. um, what does a naked life mean to you? To me, actually, it has a lot to do with what I was talking about, about my transition. Naked life is really connecting more deeply to myself through my breath, through my body, through my values. And when I'm so deeply connected to myself, all the shoulds are so much easier to ignore. Like the outside society and people telling me how I should look, what I should like, how I should speak, how I should run my business, how I should interact with friends friends and people in my life, how I should, 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 should. When I am rooted in my own self, that stuff just quiets down. It gets so much easier to ignore. And I'm like naked from the coat of other people's shoulds (laughs) weighing me down. Oh, and I love that. Naked from the coat. That I'm gonna steal that <laughs> I'm gonna borrow. I will borrow that Take line. It. I will remember to tag because I did not come up with this. Uh, thank you so much for coming on today, Gabby. I had so much fun. Thanks, Lo. This has been awesome. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Naked Life Podcast. Please remember to rate, review, subscribe to this podcast, and share with all your friends.